It was the biggest trial in the history of South Carolina. It captivated the nation. Shocking allegations, jaw-dropping revelations. Alec Murdoch, a lawyer from a family of lawyers who ran the criminal and civil courts in the low country of South Carolina for generations. A family who literally decided who would and who would not be prosecuted. But that influence and control came crashing down with Alec Murdoch steering the family name into criminal infamy. First, he lied to and cheated clients, co-workers and friends. Then, he committed the ultimate betrayal by executing his wife Maggie and his youngest son Paul. The only member of his family he didn't kill, his son Buster. And now for the first time since the shocking verdict, Buster speaks out. Plus, Alec and his attorney in trouble for some phone calls from the jail that were recorded and released to the media. Then, what is going on in the case of Stephen Smith? And what does Buster have to say about that? Tonight, we round up the usual suspects and head back down to the low country as Buster Murdoch breaks his silence. I'm Benny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. We're back in the low country tonight. Important story and developments in this case that we're going to talk about. And it all involves Buster Murdoch speaking out for the first time. But first, I want to give you a little, a little context as we go through some of the things that Buster Murdoch is saying about the case, about the trial, about his father, etc. And I want to remind you of a, of a trial I covered years ago. As a matter of fact, it was the first big trial I covered here on Court TV, involved a man named Dr. Dirk Greiniter. Dr. Dirk Greiniter from Massachusetts, a Harvard doctor, was accused of murdering his wife. Now, part of the evidence in the case was his DNA on the inside of the killer's gloves and the blood from the victim, his wife, who he bludgeoned to death in the woods, all over the gloves. These gloves were, were tossed into a sewer near the scene of the crime, in the wooded woods where he was going for a walk with his wife. Um, so there was some compelling evidence. I mean, strong evidence. There was circumstantial evidence, um, and, and of course the DNA is some of that circumstantial evidence, but like, it was on the gloves of the killer. And these were dimpled gloves. And on the, the glasses that he was wearing were little dimpled blood marks that were consistent with the dimples on the glove. I mean, this was compelling, compelling uh, evidence in the case that convinced the jury, clearly beyond any and all reasonable doubt, but not his children. And his children are not stupid. They were adults. Two of the three were doctors. One went to Harvard, one went to Yale. I mean, incredibly bright young people. But this was their dad accused of murdering their mom. So even DNA from their father on the killer's gloves was not enough to convince them that their father had killed their mother. And I learned a lesson in that trial and in subsequent cases where there were children. It's, it's difficult for them to accept. It's difficult for them to believe that dad killed mom or mom killed dad. Some do, but it's rare, it's rare. So that's a little bit of context. This whole process uh, of, of where one spouse is murdering another, it's just not fair to the kids. It puts them in such an awful place for the rest of their lives. Like, how do you reconcile this in your mind? It's so, so difficult. And, and I feel bad for all the kids because these are the ones that didn't do anything wrong. They're, in, they're stuck in the middle. Mom killed dad or dad killed mom. It's difficult to convince them. And I don't, I don't know how we should treat them, how we should think about them. Um, I just know from every case that I've covered through the years on, on Core TV, um, it's always been in a really tough, tough spot to be in. Now, let's talk about the Murdochs. You've got uh, Maggie, Paul, Buster, only one of them is alive now. Only one of them is alive. Two out of three, murdered by Alec. That was proven. 
I saw it, you saw it, the world saw it, beyond any and all reasonable doubt. Clear to me, there was no one, I mean, I, no one else, no other suspect in any of this. No evidence that anyone else was there, for goodness sake. So only one of them's alive. And the one who has survived, Buster, has broken his silence and is speaking out. And that's going to be the focus of this hour because he's speaking about a bunch of things and other things are happening. Um, but again, he's in this very difficult spot, but he's an adult, right? He's not a little kid. He's an adult and he was there for the whole trial. So the evidence that you saw, the testimony you heard, he saw and he heard as well. But he's coming from a much different uh, perspective, a much different place than anyone else. So Martha McCallum from uh, Fox News asked Buster Murdoch if he thought his father got a fair trial in an interview for the new series, The Fall of the House of Murdoch on Fox Nation. Here's what he said. I do not believe it was fair. Why? And I was there for six weeks studying it, and I think it was a, a tilted table from the beginning. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of the jurors felt that way prior to when they had to deliberate. It was predetermined in their minds prior to when they ever heard any shred of evidence that was given in that room. All right. So what are we going to take from this? What do, what do we think of what he's saying? Well, you don't want to just hear from me. we got to go down to the low country. Joining me tonight, well, first in Charlotte, North Carolina, the host of the Murdoch Family Murders Impact of Influence podcast, who spent a ton of time down there, Matt Harris. Joining us in Columbia, South Carolina, the attorney representing Stephen Smith's mother, Sandy, host of the Cup of Justice podcast, Eric Bland, and also in Columbia, South Carolina, criminal defense attorney, lawyer Lori on TikTok. Millions of views, day in and day out. Lori Murray is with us. All right, great to see everyone tonight. Um, all right, um, Eric, I'll start with you. We're going to start down in the low country. Eric, your, your thoughts about Buster Murdoch coming out, breaking his silence? Well, you know, for a year I've stayed off of Buster and, and said that he was a victim. He lost a, a brother and a mother, and for all intents and purposes, he lost a father. But when he chose to go out and speak and make the statement that the jury, the media, uh, the podcasters, and the prosecutors railroaded his father and are responsible for his father's guilt, after he said that his father's a psychopath, manipulator, a liar, and a cheat, um, is a little bit too much for me to swallow without having commenting on. I mean, it... It puts him in a bad position. Obviously, they're appealing the murder conviction. And if he came out on TV and said, my father's a murderer, he did it, um, it could have an impact on the appeal. Um, plus, he has to live with himself. You know, for a long time, we've infanticized Buster. And we've forgotten that he's a 27-year-old man. And it's very difficult if you call your father a psychopath. And you clearly didn't know that prior to the uh, allegations of murder. And you didn't know that he stole and he lied and he cheated. You, you really have to take a step back and start to look at your father in a different light. And he's unwilling to do that. He's blaming everybody else. Um, he got a jury of his peers to try him. Now, it's not the jury of the country club peers that Buster wanted him to be, be tried with. But um, there's no question in my mind that that Buster is just not confronting the obvious. And it's sad. Um, I don't think he did a good job in trying to rehab a reputation or to try to separate him from his family so that he can go on with his life. I mean, he's tainted with this. His, bro his uncle Randy has said that there's no question that his father is hiding something and it was there at the time of the murders and knows more. Uh, Buster cannot give an explanation of why his father lied to him for two years about being at the kennel. And at the very least, his father was there at the time when these murders happened, even if you're going to say he didn't pull the trigger. So um, for me, it was sad to see this, a son go through this. Obviously, it was a financial uh, a benefit to him to do this. And uh, 
you know, it's just uh, disappointing. Matt Harris, he went after podcasters, went after everybody. What are your thoughts? I completely disagree with Eric on this one. I love EB, but uh, this is his dad. And yeah, and I think he came off great. He totally said, my dad stole money. He's a scumbag for doing that. He's a, a terrible person and all that. Okay, so he acknowledges that, but that doesn't mean he has to accept that he killed his mother and his brother. It's his dad. He knew the relationship they had. It is hard for me to wrap my head around a father killing a son or a daughter. I can't, it, 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 it's unimaginable let alone if it's your own father. And there was, and he's not like the only one in the whole world that doesn't think that, uh, or has some, at least some doubt whether Alec did it or not, and has some concern about maybe some of the jurors went with preconceived notions. They do. Any high profile case, they're gonna have preconceived notions. That's not really a big deal. It's the job of the attorneys to, to turn that around. I don't think there's anything wrong or sad about a guy holding on to the love of his father and his family and not drawing a straight line from financial crimes that he shot my brother point blank in the face. To call that sad, I, I think is misguided. I think that it is what many, many people would do. I think uh, he, it, to think that he's gonna stop loving his dad or, or say guilty because the jury did. There's a lot of people out there, a lot of people who don't think Alec was uh, guilty or at least believe that it wasn't proven. So I, I just don't think it's fair to call it sad that a guy defends his dad, not against all the crimes, the financial crimes. He calls a psychopath? He, 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 you call him a psychopath, Matt. That doesn't make him a murderer. It was a, it was a, a way it was referred to. I think he she asked him something about it. I don't remember exactly how it was worded, but he takes full responsibility for the crap he did by stealing money. But he doesn't have to be roll over and say, my dad shot my brother point blank in the face. Well, I don't understand how you could expect him to do that. I think that's unfair. We don't expect him to do it, but I don't expect him to do an interview like he did. Um, Why would, when, when, people, are, when people, people are podcast saying that he's <laughs> having a gay relationship with Stephen Smith, he's got to speak. Or it's going to continue. Everybody and what's wrong with speaking. defending your father? Everybody is speaking about Buster except Buster. And it's his turn to speak. Exactly. It's his, you know, the, my, my feeling on this whole thing is there are, like Matt said, a lot of people who don't believe that Ellick killed Maggie and Paul. I am one of those people. I do uh, listen to the whole trial. I don't believe that he pulled the trigger. I, I find it very difficult to believe. I believe that he knows who did I believe that's what his brother Randy is talking about. That he knows says that he knows more than he's letting on. But there was a time problem there. There was a clothes problem there. There was the fact that even the Snapchat video that it where he's in the background, they're laughing and having a good time. That's literally five minutes before he supposedly gunned them down. I have a problem with that. And it's okay if Buster, his son, chooses to see those same problems. And it's okay if he calls out the media and the podcasters and people like me who have been talking about this case because we have been calling out that family since the day this murder happened. Now, in the new interview with Fox Nation, uh, Martha McCallum asked Buster what he thought of the police investigation into his father for the death of his brother and mother. So you think the police didn't do the job? I think there's an awful lot of pressure to come up with a suspect. So who, who would be the suspect? Who, who would the suspect be in all of this? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't, you know, come up with a suspect, they, you know, to say the police were unfair, I mean, they were kind of soft, I thought, in the beginning. Like, it was pretty obvious you got to take a look at this guy from the beginning. But it seemed like he was controlling things. That's, that's what I remember, Eric. Am, am, am I remembering this wrong? No, you're correct. They, they waited a whole year and a half before they charged him. Um, th this was a methodical uh, investigation, and every turn led back to Alex. Remember, there there is no other suspect. Alex has never offered anyone other than 
uh, the evidence pointing to himself. He has never once when he is in prison or jail said, hey, what is being done to find out who killed uh, mom and Paul? His, his lies were unnecessary. Only a guilty man would tell the lies. He, he changed his clothes. He, he lied about the most important thing and that is being at the kennels. And his son says that the evidence was malarkey, the motive was malarkey, and he, he, he downgraded the evidence of the phones and the technology, the phone mapping, the videos. I can understand him criticizing the motive of the financial crimes. Yes, that's a tenuous connection. Always all of us admitted to that. It's a, a thread that can be uh, bent and, and, and but, but importantly, pulled. not something but that you have to prove at trial. You don't have to prove the motive. It's not, not an element right. of the crime. Right. But they brought it in. But the technology so evidence was overwhelming. But the burden is on the technology state. Technology evidence so was Alec overwhelming. Murdoch does it. Elliot Murdoch does not have to prove his innocent. I do believe that he's right, that there were problems with this investigation. There are tire marks all over the place out there. Where'd they come from? There there were a lot of things. You have uh, Agent Owens who admitted on the stand that he lied to the grand jury, that he said there was evidence there that wasn't there. There were a lot of things that were suspect with the investigation. I don't think the defense did a great job in bringing those things forward. I think that there were a lot of things that could have been brought forward that weren't. And I think the judge. I think we're arguing two different things, us, right? We're arguing two we? different things. We're arguing whether there were mistakes in there. We can make that argument. There's always but mistakes. The argument Let is, me tell you, I've Buster watched trials Buster. for 20 years here on Court TV. Buster. There's always mistakes, right? Right. And the question is, but does the mistake lead to like uh, injustice, or is it just not a perfect? I mean, they're responding to the scene well, what of this horrible is, crime. You're not going to see everything. It's every right, case. Right. But Vinny, it's two different arguments. I think it's two different arguments. Are you going to see everything, or is Buster allowed to see what he sees? If, if you're saying it's sad that Buster looks at it that way, I disagree. If you want to argue the other side, which is there was mistakes made or there wasn't made, that's one thing. But to say Buster is not allowed to see mistakes because it's his dad and his family. I don't think that's fair to argue. Yeah. Well, I'm just he, arguing. I can see why he would like, see that. He's going after the police. I'm defending the police in this one. That they want to. I mean, it, this wasn't, yeah, this wasn't the rush to judgment think, here. Well, you're a prosecutor. You're think, always going to defend the police. Not always. <laughs> not if the police do something wrong, I'm not going to. I, but you're I'm right. Kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Silver Fox. They, I know. <laughs> Let, let's take a look at this because he didn't. He didn't blame his father at all. He never blamed, he didn't blame his, his father, father for all the financial crimes. Acted during. He blamed his father but for, how about for lying he about where he was at the time of the slaughter. Lying, Matt. You're you're no, just erasing again, what happened at that time. Because I will say I'm this. I'm not erasing. I'm saying it's evidence. okay for Buster to say that. Here, here, but here, here's something else. In in one of the cases that I covered, I'm not going to mention which one it is at the at the time. The 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 father's accused of murdering the mother. There are two trials. There's, there's the first trial and the second trial. After the first trial, the son was convinced that his father had lied, was, was guilty because he lied about um, some important facts in the case at the first trial because the father testified at the first trial. And this is the same scenario where you've got the father caught in a lie. I don't know any way around it. So I have seen a, a, a son be convinced that his father's guilty based upon his father's own lies, but that's not happening here. I want to put this up on the screen um, because this is interesting as well. This is another quote from uh, Buster Murdoch. He says, I think I set myself up to be safe, but yes, when I go to bed at night, I have a fear that there's somebody that is still out there. He's afraid of someone still out there potentially. Um, Lori, do you think he's in any danger? Do you think he should be fearful? No, because if you if you believe like I do that he that Alec was not responsible for the killings, but that he knew who did, there would be one reason why he's not telling on who it was that committed these crimes, and that would be to protect Buster. So I think that it's it's likely that there is somebody else out there, but I don't think it's likely that they're going after Buster, or they would have already gone after Buster. Do you think you should be fearful, Matt? Honestly, do you think Buster? I don't I mean, think so, but I, I can Alec I can wasn't so fearful why. the night of the... I, I remember part of the case was, and part of the argument was that Alec wasn't so fearful for the safety of, of Buster after these murders either, really. Well, I, I don't think he should be fearful, but I 
can understand why he might be. There might be a little PTSD when you see pictures of your mother and your brother blown to bits. That might cause a little bit of a mental issue which could go into fear or anxiety or sleepless nights. I personally don't think he should be, but I totally get why he might be. But, but it was a really killer who didn't images. bring the guns to the scene of the crime, right? Eric, yeah, wasn't that the way it was? I mean, it's like the their own guns, guns that were used. Yeah. So it was a killer who showed up it's you know, ridiculous. unarmed. I mean, no, no killer is going to come to their property without a gun and go to the house and take the guns and then kill them with guns that belong to the Murdochs. Nobody's going but to that's that a different argument. property. I promise you that. You could be 100% right about that, Eric. You could be, I believe, I believe you're 100% right. I agree with you. But that doesn't mean that Buster can't be feeling a certain way after seeing those pictures. I, I'm 100% I'm well, with you, I'm, what you I'm, just I said right fully, there. I that's a separate agree argument. That he has a right to feel that way. Right. But I think, but we, I think right we're agreeing that, that there's no one out but there can't come at who's going to be going after any Murdochs right now. Cases on appeal. I, I personally think that sorry, sorry, we have the lism. What's that, Lori? Lori, go. Because I personally think that we have a problem with all of this, that, that with Buster thinking that there's somebody out there, again, you know, it's not unreasonable for this kid to want to believe that his dad's in it. I've seen cases where the, the child has testified against the parents. In this case, it's so circumstantial, and none of us were there, and nobody knows what happens. So yes, oh, the somebody guns knows. Were used for the family guns. I think Alex yes, knows. But he's not talking. Yeah. I agree. I he talked. He, he lied he's though. He's not talking. All right, everyone, staying with us. We got more to get to. We're going to talk about some trouble that Alec is in, and his lawyers in trouble as well. Plus, coming up in the next hour. In Thomasville, Georgia, and the Bahamas, Lindsay Shiver, mother of three, accused of trying to hire a hitman with her Bahamian boyfriend to kill her husband in the midst of a heated divorce. Tonight, newly released 911 calls revealing a lot more about what was going on in this bitter battle. With the way that she is behaving, I feel like she might try and call the police to try to set me up as soon as I get there. And I wanted to try to get out in front of it because I'm not a, a risk of, you know, doing anything crazy. A victim with celebrity ties from Stormy Daniels to once being engaged to Drew Carey. Now her alleged killer faces a jury. The Hollywood Obsession Murder Trial. Trial coverage weekdays at 8, 7 central on Court TV. These are the cases that captivated the world. Couldn't keep my life straight. They were killed by their own children. Jeffrey! Court TV Legendary Trials. Go to CourtTV.com slash Legendary Trials to find out how to watch. Sorry to bug you again real quick. Um, hey, where's no Liberty? Um, she's back at the house, which I just left. Okay. How about call her and tell her I'm trying to get her? Okay. What do you need from her? I need her to put some money on a canteen. There's a guy who doesn't get canteen, and canteen is the commerce. I know what it is. You know, I mean, it's, it's the commerce. It's the trade. And... It really helped me last week when she put it on that Lucas's account. I want her to do that one more time. Okay, it's just outside looking in looks a little weird. What do you mean? It just looks a little weird. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I get what you're saying, but I mean, I may deal with somebody. I give them fifteen dollars. See, I can only do sixty dollars on my account. I understand. I'm just saying, and I'm not saying you are, man. I just, just really hope you're not in there doing anything you shouldn't be doing. That's Buster speaking with his father, Alec, from the jail. Uh, that's before the trial. And, you know, there's some little thing going on with putting money over here, over in these accounts. And Buster's a little skeptical of his father there. I want to put this on the screen because now there's more problems with phone calls for Alec Murdoch after his conviction. Uh, inmate 
And this is an incident report from the Department of Corrections. Inmate Alec Murdoch participated in an interview with Fox Nation for an upcoming documentary entitled The Fall of the House of Murdoch. During the interview for the news media, which he recorded and provided to the production company, inmate Murdoch willingly and knowingly abused his telephone privileges to communicate with the news media for his own gain. Now, his attorney, Jim Griffin, uh, also in a little bit of hot water with Alec Murdoch. You remember he's part of the defense team. Um, this is a letter from the Department of Corrections to Jim Griffin. Your client was recently convicted of an internal disciplinary infraction related to your June 10th, 2023 telephone conversation with him where Mr. Murdoch was reading excerpts from a journal he maintained during the Colton County trial. In our Inspector General's interview of Mr. Murdoch, he indicated that you recorded those journal entries and provided them to the media. Inmates in the custody of the South Carolina Department of Corrections are not allowed to participate in interviews of this nature. Attorney calls are provided to assist with legal claims, not for unrelated purposes. All right. Let's bring back in our guests still with us, Matt Harris, Eric Bland, and Lori Murray. And joining us from Port Royal, South Carolina, criminal defense attorney, longtime acquaintance of Alec Murdoch, Jared Newman. Jared, great to see you again tonight as well. The whole gang with us. Uh, Jared, what do you think of, of these phone calls? Uh, Jim Griffin recording these calls. Is this a problem? Is it, were you shocked when you heard about this? I <clears throat> I, I am, and the way it went down, you struck me with one of the things you said on the first show I was on with you, how fragile our law licenses are. And, you know, we know what the rules of ethics are. If you do criminal law, you know what the rules of the South Carolina Department of Corrections are. There are ways to do it. There, there are ways to have client interviews. You go through wardens and lawyers and all that. It's not impossible. It, it's just um, lawyers can't participate in... Um, it was clearly a go-between conduit, it seemed to me, to get an interview out. Yeah, and, and the allegation is that Jim Griffin is the one recording all this. Lori Murray, your thoughts. You practice law down there. Are you surprised by this development? I don't know if surprised would be the right word, but uh, it's, it's certainly not something that I would do. It's certainly something that Jim Griffin knows that he shouldn't do, uh, but surprise wouldn't be the word that I would used. I thought it was really interesting that one of the the journal entries that was on that Fox Nation specials was that uh, was Alex saying that he trusted Jim Griffin completely. And I was I thought to myself, well, what else are you going to say when you're reading to Jim Griffin? But, you know, I, I would never have done this. And I don't think I know any attorneys that would do this. But this has been such a high profile case. And everybody Every time his name comes up, the views go up, the the ticks go up, and and I, I'm not calling anybody out for me too on my account on, on TikTok. But so whenever you get a chance to put something else out there and make a little bit more um, impact on the media and on your social media, you know I think Jim Griffin let his let the, that get the better of his judgment and he made a mistake. Uh, Jim Griffin spoke with Chanley Painter. This was after the after the verdict, um, and talked about that relationship uh, with Alec Murdoch. Let's take a listen. We will certainly, um, and, and we're working on that to, to get more funds so we can get appellate lawyers to, because you need a fresh set of eyes on these cases, any any case on appeal. So, so we're working on getting appellate lawyers involved to to specialize in appellate work. But we're, but we're, we're not abandoning Alex. So, um, Eric, what do you think? Do you think all of this was just a, a way to raise funds to help on the def what is what is what is going on here with with you've got your defense attorney recording um, calls for Fox Nation while all this is being put together? Well, you know, we won the motion that denied Alex the right to get $160,000 from the uh, receiver funds to pay for his appeal. We won that motion and Jim Griffin lost. So that was a problem that they don't have uh, readily available attorney fees. But don't forget, Jim was also admonished by Judge Newman during the trial for talking to the press about the Kathleen Parker arg uh, article. There's a real public policy reason behind why South Carolina does not let convicted criminals talk to the media, and that is because they don't want the victims to be victimized again for the 
uh, criminal who's now convicted to be able to tell a story that makes the victims relive this. And Jim Griffin knows this. And this is a this was in direct contravention to the rules of the Department of Corrections. And so now Alex has lost his tablet for a time period and his uh, ability to do phone calls. But one thing that was interesting is he used the PIN number from another inmate. So that tells me that he's now making uh, relationships in, in prison. He's doing okay if other prisoners would let him use his PIN number. Um, it was disappointing because Jim is a good lawyer. He's a, a an ethical lawyer. And I think this was a, a trip that he shouldn't have done. And uh, But it was clearly designed to sell the story. And that's what it was sold to. It was sold to Fox Nation. Remember, Dick Harpootlian is a Democratic senator and a Democrat to his bones who hates Fox News. And for Dick Harpootlian to go on Fox News would, is an extraordinary thing. The, the people in South Carolina know that, that he would go on a more mainstream media. But Fox News obviously was willing to pay what they wanted for this story. And they created a story. Well, um, I, have, I, I haven't seen any, any release saying that they got paid, but obviously we're looking at circumstantial well, evidence here. Um, about and I demand some money because my co-host Seton was on the show and we got not one you, cent. You got zero, right? You got zero. Um, zero! <laughs> Jared, let me ask you, what do you think about Alec Murdoch's life in prison? Do you think he is, is becoming sort of like a kind of like a godfather type figure in there where he's controlling things and trying to manipulate people? Or do you think he's just trying to get by? What, what are your thoughts? Well, who are we in ourselves? Why, why is he going to be different in the inside on the outside? Inside prison, you better learn some coping skills real quick. Um, already, I've heard him on that one phone call giving money to other people. That's called loan sharking. You don't give people money just because you want to help them. Uh, I think Alex is probably the mayor of the cell block um, and could be scam after scam. I saw some pictures of him in there. He didn't look all that unhappy, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> we, we did see those pictures. Um, what do you think, Lori? What type of, what, what is the rest of his life going to be? Because I don't think he's winning any appeals. I don't think he's ever getting out. Um, do you think he, he, he adapts and ends up living some sort of a life on the inside. I think that's what they all do, but I do think he has some valid, at least questions for appeal. I don't know that he'll win them, but there are some valid questions from this trial. But, you know, I heard that he was in solitary, that he had been locked down, you know, they were keeping him away from Gen Pop, and then he asked to be moved into Gen Pop. My uh, tenant that lives, or works right next door to me, was in the jail a couple weeks ago, and he walked down the hall with agents when being interviewed. I think it was the highlight of probably her summer. But so he's in there. He was laughing and joking with the agents as he walked down the hall. I think he, you're right. He's not unhappy in there. Um, maybe he needed that structure so that everything around him, the craziness that was swirling around him with his finances and the firm is taken care of, and all he has to worry about is uh, not getting shanked. Yeah, and, and Eric mentioned this. Let's put it up on the screen. On 8-9-23, this is a, another incident report from the Department of Corrections. At approximately 2.25 uh, p.m., a call was made to blank by inmate blank pin number. On the call, I recognized the voice of uh, Richard Murdoch, which is Alec Murdoch. Inmate stated he's using someone else's pin number because his is not working. Um, Matt, I, I always look at Murdoch, and I think this is the way he's lived his life, and this is this is what we what we learned about him through the, the trial and everything else. He's always like looking for an angle somewhere. One of those guys who has to have an angle on something, even if he doesn't need it. Right? He's gonna he's gonna right. figure out an angle, and I think that's exactly what he's doing on the inside now. Well, I, when you talk to people down there, and they'll all agree is that. He was that guy that would go to the Piggly Wiggly and be like, hey, Jack, how's your daughter Sophie doing? Hey, Wally, how's uh, life at the uh, car wash? You know, he has that ability to win people over. He knows names. He, that, that's what I've heard. He just knows. And you know, they talk about in court. He, that's why he probably wanted to testify. He has this ability to win people over. And I think that he's always going to use that 
in whatever situation is. I mean, I, I don't necessarily believe that he's happy, but you don't want to necessarily walk. I haven't done much time, but I don't think you want to walk around and be like, uh, 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 uh. you kind of want to look. Yeah, have you have confidence and like, yeah. hey, everybody, I'm the cool uh, guy. I can see that, right? He's yeah. walking down. Hey, Bobby, how's that shiv you're working on? Yeah. Uh, how's it come <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you got that soap for me? Hey, uh, you got any cigarettes? Hey, yeah. hey. You know, he's got his thing going on. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, may I say goodbye to uh, Lori Murray. Check her out on TikTok. Jared Newman, great to see you as well. Uh, Matt and Eric are going to stay with us. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, what Buster Murdoch had to say about uh, Stephen Smith. And what is going on in the Stephen Smith death investigation? Uh, we'll find out when we come back. I was awakened by my brother screaming. Was pounding on the door. Bang, bang, bang. People don't realize human beings like that can exist in the world. He said that we'd seen his face and there was no way that he could ever let us go. They were not going to let me go easily. You better fight, and you better get out of here. I survived because I'm a born fighter. I survived tonight at 10, 9 Central on Court TV. Somebody was there. It was more than one person that done this. Mm -hmm. And somebody knows. Yeah. And they set him up on that road to make it look like a hit and run. I was so happy when they reopened the case. Um, and that gave me hope, and he wasn't under the rock anymore. And with all this stuff going on, you know, he gets more attention now. But we really don't want the attention. We just want the answers. The mysterious unsolved case of the homicide of Stephen Smith down in the low country of South Carolina. We've covered this story extensively. Um, and there is some connection to the Murdochs. And, and the connection came through part of the investigation into his death. Take a listen uh, to Buster's classmate who was, who was interviewed in all this. Can you tell me what you heard about the Stephen Smith incident? You heard what? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and who was that? Okay. Um, and I'll and I'll be honest with you, Tatiana. Buster Murdoch's been on our radar long before this. Okay, so that's where he came from. He was on investigators' radar, Buster Murdoch being involved in the death of Stephen Smith. Classmate there saying, you know, there's rumors all over the place. So uh, in this special, Buster Murdoch does address it. Take a look, folks. Here's what he said in the fall of the House of Murdoch interview. Um, I did not have any personal intimate relations with Stephen, and that cannot be proven because it is baseless. I never had anything to do with his murder. I never had anything to do with him on a physical level of any regard. Okay, so what's going on? Let's bring back in uh, Eric Bland is still with us, represents Sandy Smith and Matt Harris, host of the Murdoch uh, podcast, Impact of Influence. Um, Eric, um, one, reaction to his statement. Two, where are we in this investigation? Well, my reaction is similar to what I've been saying for the last five months, that I have no direct knowledge um, that Buster Murdoch or any Murdoch had anything to do with Stephen's uh, death. There is an investigation going on. It is proceeding. Um, the Murdoch name is all over the, uh, the investigative file that was released by the Highway Department in 2021. So that is beyond dispute. I think his answer... Um, and probably, I'm not going to quibble with his words, but what he said is, you know, he didn't say I didn't have any knowledge about how Stephen died. He said I didn't have anything to do with it. So that was a little bit quizzical. And he also used the the same excuse that his father used, and that is regarding Gloria Satterfield. When Alex changed his story a couple of weeks ago, he said, um, you know, that Gloria was not tripped by the dogs. It was, you know, I lied. The problem was that Maggie and Paul were witnesses to that uh, fall uh, at the time, and they're dead. And he, Paul just, uh, excuse me, Buster just said he was at 
the Edisto Beach House at the time that um, Stephen was shot. The problem was, he said, I was with Maggie and Paul. That can't be proven because they've been killed. Um, I don't know what the investigation is going to reveal. We do know that uh, a person of interest named Patrick Wilson, who is also named in the investigative file, was arrested last week on a pending charge. He had a trial. He was moved from Greenville to Hampton, and he was tried on an open container uh, charge. He was convicted, and he's still in jail. And I don't know whether they're using that um, as, a, a, as a pressure point to get him to talk, but he was named as a person of interest along with Sean Connolly. I have no idea whether they have anything to do with it or they have knowledge, but uh, I do talk to Chief Keel regularly and he tells me that they are making progress. Uh, he's satisfied with the pace of the investigation and he, st he remains positive. That's all I can get from SLED. It is unusual open container to still be held. Like yeah. that's not a major thing. In jail. Yeah. Matt, what yeah. are your thoughts tonight? Um, well, I'll ask Eric this too, because he, you, you heard that story that his, uh, that Buster's cell phone was dinged somewhere outside of the area at the time. Have you heard that thing? And was that anything that you talked to Keel about? I have I'll, not, I'm no. interviewing you now. I have, I have not, Matt. Yeah. That's the first I've heard about it. I'm doing the interview now, Vinny. Just take, you can relax. Not a problem. Now. I got this. Not a problem, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. No. It's uh, I, Eric's did a great job, uh, you know, pushing this forward, and uh, you know, it, it the the rumors in a in a town like that can catch fire pretty quickly, especially if it's about the the rich family. It's one side of the tracks versus other side of the tracks. Lack of a better term, that becomes automatically a kind of battle. So it sucks hard if. Buster had nothing to do with this because it's just false accusations with absolutely zero proof. Um, and then right now we have zero proof. And yet his name's been dragged through the mud for two years on top of the other crap that he's going through. Uh, it just doesn't seem right. And I, but I get that because his name's in the report, it's going to be reported on. So I get that. It just, uh, hopefully, the, the, the key, the, the big thing is, we need to find out because somebody knows. Somebody has to have that guilt, tick, 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 Edgar Allan Poe kind of telltale heart thing happening. And they're going to go, I can't take it anymore. Here's what happened. I just can't believe that everybody will remain quiet forever. Yeah, I, I, I think we're getting closer, closer, and closer, hopefully, um, especially for his mom. Uh, Eric Bland, Matt Harris, uh, great to have you both back on the program. Always great to get together. Uh, we appreciate it, and let's stay in touch.